Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and we come today to Proverbs chapter 27. We resume our study in verse number 1. Get your Bible, I hope you can, and turn it to Proverbs chapter 27. We'll begin in just a minute. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is an important place that you can go because it's all about the Word of God. That's all you will find at this website. There are over 35 years of archive teaching <clears throat> going through the whole Bible four times, verse by verse. That's right. It's verse by verse, just like we're going to do today, just like I have been doing for over 35 years. In-depth Bible study going through all 31,000 plus verses in the English Bible. Choose, click, and listen. And all you need to bring is your Bible to the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Chapter 27, Proverbs, verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You and I don't know if there will be a tomorrow for us here on earth anyway. So we cannot and we should not say with certainty, I will do this or I will do that tomorrow. You can count on me. No, I can't count on you, and you can't count on me. We don't know if the world will be here tomorrow. We don't know if we will be here tomorrow. That's why God calls that kind of talk boasting. It's arrogant. It certainly is thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. We don't have the power to control where we will be tomorrow, or if we will be let alone boast about how we're going to do something for sure. The only thing that we know for certain, the only thing that we have for certain, is right now. We don't know if we will have a tomorrow. And if we do, whether it will be good or bad. Consequently, we should be we should be as close to Jesus as we possibly can be every moment, every second, while it is today. If we make that our priority, confessing when we fail, then whether tomorrow comes or not, at least we will be prepared for it. 2. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger and not thine own lips. Amazing to me how attitudes have changed about changed about the sin of boasting. From when I was little. Man, back when I back in the sixties when I was growing up, you never heard sports stars talk about how great they were. Never. And and you didn't you didn't see that in life. And if anybody ever did boast, people, people didn't like them. It was very unbecoming. And God says, do not brag. If you do something well, don't talk about it. Just leave it be. God says, let others praise you. Don't praise yourself. Very unbecoming to speak highly of ourselves. <clears throat> and I know it's been relabeled self-promotion today, like it's a positive thing. And it's become very acceptable to many. But it's still the sin of boasting. Homosexuality has become acceptable. It's still the sin of sodomy. So it doesn't matter 
what the world thinks or what has become acceptable. Truth is truth, right and right, wrong and wrong. They're the same. And God decides which is which. And I will hasten to add that there is nothing wrong with telling someone what you've accomplished if they are thinking about hiring you. That's a different story. They need honest information so that they can decide what to do, whether they should invest in you or not. So that form of honesty so that somebody can properly evaluate you for employment, that's one thing. But just boasting is another thing altogether. If you're giving information about yourself for a legitimate reason, if you're giving information about yourself because a decision needs to be made concerning you, well, that's okay. But if you're giving information because you just want to impress people, if you're giving information because you're full of sinful pride, you just want to call attention to yourself for no good reason other than that, that's boasting. You say, well, that sounds like it might be a fine line. Not really, but I know one thing for sure. You and God know when you have crossed that line. And if you cross it, you need to repent and confess it like any other sin. Three, a stone is heavy and the sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. When an evil person gets angry, it puts a real strain <clears throat> on anyone who's unfortunate enough to be around them. And that's because sinful anger makes life miserable for everyone. Why? Because <clears throat> if a fool, remember a fool is somebody who doesn't follow the word of God, who disregards the word of God. That's God's definition of a fool. So if a fool is angry, which by default it would be sinful anger, it's not righteous indignation, it's sinful anger. If someone who has no regard for God or the word of God is angry, then you know that it has absolutely nothing to do with righteous indignation. Their anger is all about self, and it's going to be destructive. By the words they use, by the things that they throw, the things that they do. Fools get angry, angry for selfish reasons. Somebody did something that they don't like, and they're furious about it. it. has nothing to do with God. They just don't like it. Or how about this one? Somebody is keeping them from being able to do something wrong. A fool gets angry when somebody hinders them from sinning. I'll kill you. I'll beat the loving tar out of you. Because I want to do this and you say it's sinful. They hate it when they can't have their own way. They're like a mother bear robbed of her cubs, but at least a mother bear robbed of her cubs has a legitimate reason to be angry. Four, wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Envy or jealousy is dangerous. Envy or jealousy makes people mean. Envy or jealousy, those two things are sin in and of themselves, but they lead to other sins. For example, Cain murdered his brother Abel because he was jealous of him. Cain did the, or Abel did the right thing. He was blessed by God. Cain did the wrong thing. He was not blessed by God. Instead of repenting, he got angry at Abel and killed him. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery because they were jealous of him. The religious leaders condemned Jesus to death, turned him over to Pilate because they were jealous of him. Jealousy needs to be contained and removed before it hurts someone. Now, I should add quickly that not all jealousy is sinful. <clears throat> it can't be because the Bible says that God is jealous 
He's jealous over his people, and God cannot sin, so not all jealousy is sinful. It's not example or it's not sinful, for example, if a man is fooling around with a woman and his wife gets jealous. She has a right to be jealous. He belongs to her. It's not sinful if a woman is fooling around with a man and her husband is jealous. He has a right to be jealous. Five. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Now, open rebuke is not fun. Who in the world likes to be corrected by someone? It's not fun to be corrected, even by a friend. No one wants to no one wants others to see their flaws and point them out. No one enjoys it when their when their friends, even out of love and concern, bring bring up bad things that they do. But a true friend will risk putting a strain on that friendship. They will speak the truth because they care and they want to help. So open rebuke is what God is talking about. This is why modern evangelical, and I've heard them, I've heard them praise modern evangelical pastors who are so lukewarm in their preaching. They will not call sin, sin. They will not call people to repentance. They will never talk about hell. They will never talk about the wrath of God. Never, ever, ever. And I've heard preachers like that be called loving by the lukewarm people who go to their churches. Oh, he's so loving. He's so gentle. He's not loving. That's not loving. A preacher who loves the people that he ministers to We'll tell them the truth. We'll call sin, sin. We'll call people to repentance. We'll talk about hell. We'll talk about God's wrath. We'll talk about repentance. They'll talk about these things. Even though that open rebuke makes people feel uncomfortable. They'll talk about it because they care about them. They want them to change. And so God says, <clears throat> open rebuke is better than secret love. Secret love or hidden love refers to those who do not have enough commitment to the one they supposedly care about to tell them when they are wrong. I don't want to upset them. You coward. Especially if you're a preacher. You dirty, rotten coward. Well, if I tell them the truth, I'll upset them and they might not come back. Well, then they don't come back, but do your job. You love yourself. That's the problem. Six, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Sometimes a good friend will say things that seem harsh, but they really aren't. Truth often is mistaken for harshness or being insensitive. The truth sometimes hurts. So even if it's spoken by one who cares, it can cause short-term pain. But if that truth is heeded, it will result in long-term good. Actually, truth can be like taking terrible medicine. It's awful. But if you swallow it, instead of spitting it out, if you endure the distastefulness of terrible tasting medicine, it'll help you out. And some people hear the truth, they spit it out of their soul. Shut the book. Turn the preacher off who speaks the truth. I gotta go listen to my lukewarm modern evangelical preacher. He just says pleasant things. He's funny. He wears torn jeans and the dirty and untucked shirt. And he's got metal all over his face. He's cool. He never talks about sin. I like him. I don't like this guy. I don't like that Moret guy. He makes me feel uncomfortable. Some people hear truth. They spit it out. 
because it tastes bad to them. Well, I got news for you. It tastes bad to everybody. But if you love Jesus, you're going to endure the bad taste and take that truth and apply it. Some people spit out the truth and they go on their merry way. They continue in their error, pretending that everything is okay. I didn't hear that. Fools are happy that they don't have to taste that terrible truth. They're happy until the day that they die and are thrown into hell because they've rejected the truth that could have saved their soul. These preachers who are on television today watering down the truth of God's word, telling lies to the people that they speak to about many things, but I'm thinking especially of the sin of homosexuality because that's rampant and very acceptable today. It is one of the worst sins described in Scripture. It's an abomination. It's vile. It's evil. It will send people to hell. It was the sin that caused God to destroy two cities. The only time God ever destroyed two cities or any city or any civilization because of one particular sin. Don't tell me it's okay. And you've got practicing homosexuals in churches with no thought of repentance because they told, they're told they don't have to. You've got practicing homosexual preachers and bishops, so-called, and on and on it goes. Preachers, preachers performing homosexual marriages. And they, and they feel so comfortable. And somebody like me comes along and says, hey, what you're doing is a sin. You need to repent. You're going to go to hell, just like liars go to hell, just like murderers, just like thieves, just like adulterers, fornicators, on and on. Ah, Marat, you make me feel so uncomfortable. I'm going to turn them off. I'm never going to put them on again. Yeah, I know. You can just go ahead and feel comfortable. Until the day that you die and go to hell. But you will never forget the words that this preacher spoke. They will be echoing through your burning brain for all eternity as you suffer horrible pain in hell because you didn't repent. And by the way, look over to your left if you can see because that preacher who told you lies will be right next to you. We'll stop right there. Study all of the Bible with me verse by verse at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen. Now, in case you don't know it, I have been teaching the whole Word of God, all 31,000 plus verses, for over 35 years, verse by verse, the whole counsel of God, without watering it down. I have not added to it, I have not taken it away. I have not watered down the scriptures to make any lukewarm Christian so-called or sinner on the way to hell feel comfortable. Never, ever have I ever done that with one single verse of scripture. And you can prove it by going to the website, thebibleversebyverse.com, because it's all archived. I say that to say this. There are a lot of faulty ministries out there, to say the least. I've had people tell me it's so hard to find somebody who preaches the pure truth of God's word, especially the whole counsel of God, without watering it down. Thank you for being there, Mike. I'm just doing what God tells me to do. I don't deserve any credit. But I will tell you this, because if you would like to be a part of this proven ministry... You can be by praying for me and praying for the Word of God. That will make you an immediate part of Scripture verse by verse. And believe me, I need it and I appreciate it. Please pray for me and God's Word. And also, when you take a break from studying, you go to the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com. Click the Donate button and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead because that also will make you a part of this ministry. Thank you so much for your love for Jesus, 
your love for the Word of God. And I know you love God's Word or you wouldn't be listening to me. There's too much other stuff for you to do. Online or wherever, radio. Too many, too many things for you to do besides this. So the fact that you're doing it proves you love Jesus and God's Word. So I thank you. You're a great encouragement to me. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.